Ladies and gentlemen, it is What the Show on Tuesday night, doing something a little bit different. Uh, you might notice that uh, that's not Mike. That's not Mike next to me. That's uh, that's Mr. Koi Jandro. Uh, he came on tonight for my birthday. We're going to be talking John Dies at the end. Uh, some uh, kind of a little bit of a deep dive into a really unique feature. Um, but before we get started, it is a new month at What the Show. And if you guys are uh, new here, uh, just to let you know that that stream uh, that stream labs link that we have pinned up the top there. Uh, none of the money for that usually goes to the show. Um, that is uh, something where we've donated to charities, to people's GoFundMe's in the past. Uh, actually, on our first year, about seven thousand dollars closing out our first year to various causes across the internet. It's been it's been crazy. It's been awesome. Um, then we're going to do something a little bit different this month for what the show though. Um, my mom actually had a surgery this past month. Um, she had an arterial bark blockage in her leg, uh, and was something that was supposed to be a quick in easy outpatient procedure. I'm not going to go into too much depth, but you remove a blockage. Sometimes a piece of that blockage breaks off. They had to remove another, then make another incision and get it out before it did any, any bad damage. We've had a, a rough uh, rough time, uh, but she's on the mend. I was just telling Koi before this that she is doing stairs without a spotter. Um, she's doing amazing things these days, but um, I'm not talking to my mom about this. Uh, this is actually going to be a surprise for the end of the month that 100% of our stream labs this month will be going to help her medical expenses. Um, but with that, um, I'm joined by... One of my favorite creators on the internet, um, one of the, uh, I, I think one of the best people for me that I found to explore just crazy interpretive, uh, whatever the hell these movies are. And that's Koi Jandro. <laughs> Koi, how are you doing tonight, man? I am so excited to talk with you about this movie because uh, you and I have shared highs and lows of differences of opinion. Like we've, we've respectfully understood the other one liking stuff throughout knowing each other. This oh, yeah. is, I think, the first time where I don't know how I feel, and I love that this is the time that you and I get to actually do this, like, in person. You know what I mean? Like, this is, gets to be a dialogue instead of us monologuing at each other, because this mm -hmm. movie is so insane, I don't have a quantifiable show. Like, I don't know how I feel, and I've, like, se I've slept on it, and I never have that. I, I've uh, once described. I've described this actually on multiple occasions to people as lysergic acid diethamide, a, a horror comedy. Yeah, accurate. <laughs> and just so, like that, the colon a horror comedy. Um, it is uh, kind of a crazy piece of film. Um, now we were mentioning uh, actually before this, doing a little research. Um, so I, I actually want to start with uh, where where you are landing with the movie though actually let's let's stay a little bit organized here um so yeah, review was i, was. I never that? get to be this guy uh i overall landed with i enjoyed the experience of watching it i like where it took me i don't know how i would a pitch it b compare it i've got one film to recommend you off of it so i do have one comparison but overall it's its own animal or c why it lost me, found me, lost me, because it's so consistently... The goal of the movie is to take you on a journey, and I'm, I'm wondering, with your experience, if it ever lost you, because I can't know what lost me, because it's not inconsistent, it's just all so crazy. I'm wondering if it's just a matter of the individual stories are almost anthology-esque, even though it's not an anthology film. So I'm wondering if there were like moments that I just didn't connect, because it's so fucking weird. Yeah, and like there, there's there's definitely an A plot, a B plot, and a C plot that are happening with the same characters coinciding upon themselves, uh, which does something I think a little bit. It, it definitely is a challenge to watch this movie. Um, it's something where uh, I saw this movie when it came out. Actually, I saw it uh, at the little indie movie theater here in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, film streams and. I thought, well, that was weird. Um, it did some <laughs> some cool some cool special boy print protagonist stuff. It had some great monologues, 
Uh, and like, but I don't really know how I feel about it. There's some cool twists. Uh, I I just revisited it this past year. Um, actually, I think I I think I messaged you like a day or two after I revisited it because it was like, I wonder how Koi would take this movie. We talked about um, the ship of Theseus. I yes. think in regards to this, was that I think that was the conversation, right? Yeah, I think I think we did mention the ship ship of Theseus, and that you know having done uh, you know with WandaVision earlier this year having it's ship of Theseus moment that this eight years prior, um, is it eight or nine? Um, I think it's 14, years, right? It was, it was, it was 12. Um, oh, nine. so yeah, uh, nine years prior. Um, but did it in a really interesting way. Um, that's actually something that's part of the, the trailer is the, the hacking the sandworm and the the axe, um, which is just <laughs> so so good. And there's something that is very it was you can tell the book that this was based on was written in 2007 because there is a very emo special boy protagonist air about David Wong, but it's also kind of uh, kind of an indictment against those things and how he's uh, very over it all. He's very uh, kind of calls things out as they go he's 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 kind of like when this movie takes a big swing and it seems like it fails and like it fails on purpose most of the time the protagonist of the movie is just they're like yes yeah, kind of lame isn't it i'm just stuck here dealing with this but in a way that's absorbed into the plot of the movie uh -huh. it, it reminded me of like if ramona flowers was the lead of scott pilgrim in a good a little bit a little bit, like, yeah. Very much self-aware as a Manic Pixie Dream Girl that's anti-Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Like, it's a very self-acknowledging lead while also not being so meta that it... Like, it definitely acknowledges you, but it doesn't mm -hmm. do so in a way that lets you know that it's received. It's it's directional in its meta-ness, which is mm -hmm. a really interesting choice. When all the while, well, I mean, there's... There's some fun moments to be had in this. There are some moments where you said the plot, the plotting and pacing of this movie is. Um, thankfully, it doesn't distract too much. I think for me, from what it does well, this is. I mean, uh, it's it's kind of a C plus B minus movie for me overall. But what it does well is so good. <laughs> I, I give like, a C plus. We're actually really close on this one. Yeah, um, because it it is above average. When it's uh, succeeding, it's even exceptional. But when it's not succeeding, it's below average. So it overall lands at the C plus, like just above average as far as the whole experience. Because this isn't something I like. For me, something that's a B has to be rewatchable at least like casually. This isn't digestible enough or heady enough to go that way. So it's like just below that. Like it's yeah. very enjoyable. I'd recommend it. But it's like there's a weird pacing thing where I'm like, I don't know what. Kind of like where it left me. I mean, like when how I opened this mm -hmm. review. Like, where am I? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's pretty wild. Um, so in, in you mentioned a good way, and if you've done drugs, it is it'll speak to you. Uh, this these are facts. These these are facts. <laughs> So uh, we we mentioned uh, doing a little bit of research, a little bit of the behind the scenes on this movie. Um, so uh, where what did you discover about the, the behind the scenes of this movie that really spoke to you? Uh, the thing that that a highlight for me is it felt like it was written in pieces, and then I discovered the book was written in pieces. So I was thinking, watching it, I was like, this is like a yes and skit. Like it felt like a like not in the comedic sense, but in the format sense of like watching a really good UCB troupe build on nothing, and then the book apparently like was that online. Like it was a here's a chapter, here's a chapter, here's a chapter with a very ingenious pull of the title. The title makes you come back, so it felt like a yes and skit with a very good hook, and then it was apparently that in book form, and they adapted it so well. That that translated to my experience having not known that until I read it after the movie. Well, yeah, and like you, you mentioned, like uh, you know, like UCB stuff, that kind of thing. Um, so Jason Pargin um, was a senior editor at Cracked, um, and yep, uh, 
And he was a senior editor at Cracked. Uh, he originally did this anthology, was compiled into a novel, had trouble publishing the novel until it was picked up by an ind- uh, independent uh, publisher. And then the guy who directed Buddy uh, Bubba Hotep found it. <laughs> and that's how it got adapted. Yeah. Um, Jason Pargin, by the way, uh, one of the things that's really cool about this movie for me, going back and rewatching it, and why I rewatched this was I got done listening to a four part series that he did with uh, some other former cracked people, David Bell and Tom Ryman. Da- Tom Ryman, some people might know from Schmodown. Um, but he did a four part series on the modern blockbuster. And I was like, well, I saw your movie that grossed $140,000 in the box office. So what do you have to say about the box? What do you have to say about the blockbuster? Turns out this movie kind of says a lot about the blockbuster for me. A lot of the things that it does that are subversive. I think the the way that it, it just takes swings in storytelling in in monologuing in giving you some, some great small characters, some great, uh having a small ensemble and working with a small budget but making this feel bigger than it is um definitely being subversive it takes every swing so i don't know if this movie as a movie at least i still need to read the books and i'm i'm really interested in reading the books uh but as a film i don't know if it really uh how do i want to put this if it's something that <clears throat> was meant to be subversive of film and modern storytelling film. It's interesting when something like you and I have talked about metamodernism. I love the concept. I love the execution. Most of the time, the, the audience that might not know, it's the idea of both a wink and a nod, a a sincere irony, a, a joke that gets itself while also being funny. Like Deadpool has mastered metamodernism. He knows he's in a comic. It's very, it's very self-effacing while actually still being good. Uh, Donald Glover is, the, I think, the master of metamodernism to this day. What I wonder is how many properties are accidentally metamodernist because of our intellectualizing those concepts. Like, will things get better retroactively because we've digested a new format? And this was one of those properties where it's like, I don't know the intent versus the execution. Like, I feel like Paul Giamatti was in, in the world that the book led him to believe. But Paul mm-hmm. Giamatti is going to have a different interpretation of the book than the director, than the lead actor there. So, like, at what point is someone getting the joke in the same way I am? Because I'm going to get the joke in a different way than Paul Giamatti necessarily. So it's yeah. a fascinating thing to look at something that swings this much. It really it, it really is. And I can, I can see how you, even mentioning, like, somewhat a disjointedness among the cast. Um, the two and, are mean, interesting in different movies sometimes. They they definitely are. Um, <laughs> Chase Chase Williamson. Um, I I didn't know how to come out of this. Like he has one well, of those people has moments of brilliance, but it's like it was, it, he kind of felt like a, like a Devin Sawa kind of like Man, '90s you, horror protagonist. Like he felt like that '90s horror protagonist in a good way. Yeah, uh, and then John was just just wild uh but uh it's one where paul giamatti always swinging for the fences uh the guy who plays the the guy who plays the uh the sheriff has some amazing lines Agreed. Uh, and doug jones my I god think doug, doug jones, jones steals every i mean he's doug jones but doug jones steals every scene he's in he is the most doug jonesy i've ever seen him without any sort of makeup or prosthetics <laughs> have you ever met doug i have not that is dumb. Uh, it was alarming seeing him without pretending not to be Doug Jones. Like, if Doug Jones gets in your car, that's what's going to happen. It just makes you wonder, with like like Jason Pargin, who I mentioned, did, did he know this? <laughs> and that's the highest praise I can give either the movie or Doug Jones. Like, that's the beauty of this movie, is like, that's a compliment to both. Yeah. So uh, just real quick, we're going to do a quick recap of the chat. Uh, Lego, by the way, uh, you're going to see in the chat is Lego Land 13. Um, huge, huge fan of uh, of the books. You're mentioning here uh, that I need to read the books from my book nerd buddy. I know this. Um, uh, I It's going to be one of my next investments. Uh, Devin Sawa, was, I just re- re-experienced the fanatic 
Oh, we could be here all night if we start talking the fanatic. Um, Allison Dude, saw money on, on Twitter like a month ago, and it was so hard to keep my cool, man. Devin Sal was was my whole childhood, and I was like, nice. At first, I thought you meant Fred Durst, and I was like, holy shit. Oh, but... no, I'd lose my mind to say. Actually, that's about equal level. <laughs> that's... Like, I called my mom about Devin Sal. I'd call my dad about Fred Durst. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this shit right here. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Come on, Devin Saw was the original stand. I gotta, I gotta yeah. love for that. Uh, we got Danny, uh, Danny in the chat. Uh, also, also pretty big fan mentioning the uh, the Matt Damon pillow staring into your soul. Uh, I picked it up dramatically and didn't tell you what I was doing. At one point, you were talking, and I was like, "He won't have any idea why this is happening." Nice. <laughs> so, uh, Maxwell, Dad, a lot of awesome people in here. So. Um, Let's break into spoilers. Okay, we've warned the people. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Spoilers for a nine-year-old movie. One of my favorite things to announce on this channel. <laughs> You've had a decade. In fairness, I haven't watched it until this week. You've been warned. Yes. We gave you 15 spoiler-free minutes. So uh, we open up with that ship of Theseus thing. Um, and you can always, you can just tell from the kind of from the deliver from the dialogue delivery that like the trailers, the marketing for this movie gave you something where it's like, oh, it's kind of like a Ghost Hunters, like this is coming out when Zach Baggins is big. Uh, no, he's going into, yeah, I murdered this neo-Nazi and then, you know, the the handle broke off and had to explain it away. And you're like, who the fuck are these people? It, it opens up with great questions. You're, you're really, it opens up a mystery into the protagonist, which is further exacerbated by the, by the Chinese restaurant scene. Uh, the Chinese yes. restaurant scene. Delightful. Uh, yeah. Um, so do you, do you have your coin notes on this? I do. Uh, nice. I'm going to pull up my chaos here. Uh, oh. I took slightly less because I knew it would be a dialogue instead of a monologue. Mm -hmm. But my note about that scene in particular is I think this is one of the best uses of being a commentary on appropriation I've seen in a way that is satire that insults neither party is, is mm -hmm. the gist of my entire scene there. Because you're expecting one result, and then you receive a joke at your expense that doesn't hurt anyone. But then it makes you question the validity of the plot going forward, which is the point of the soy sauce. And the joke in itself is kind of a commentary on him calling it soy sauce. And while we're in spoilers, that setup pays off beautifully with Paul Giamatti. Like, yes. all of that takes place in this. Yeah, he's he's Wong is the most common surname in the world. Uh, Pargan, by the way, used David Wong as a as a pen name for the first book, and then decided maybe I shouldn't be using an Asian name for a pen name. Um, so funny the reality of that translating. That's the meta modernist part. Like that actually became a true problem. So, uh, so David talking about his mom uh, being crazy, crack addicted, addicted whore who spent all their money on black candles, and he's like, "I never knew my dad." He goes, "Are you my dad, Arnie?" On rewatch, that joke is, is ten very times different. funny. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, it I is... didn't put that together until you just said it. That is a very different joke, knowing how he perceives Arnie. Yeah, uh, and there there are parts of this that you need to like vaguely remember it. it is it is something that ten years down the right line, if you just think to yourself, I maybe I should check this movie out again, it will fill in some gaps, kind of like, well, you know, I mentioned certain things that uh, bend your own perception of reality. People telling you stories about that years down the right. Um, uh, my next note is about a time jump that actually ties into that. I, I wrote. I'm confused when I am, but I think that's the point. And that happened so much earlier on that I think I was prepared for. Like, I thought, I don't know when I am would happen after. Like, the opening sets you up for that. But the mm -hmm. fact that, like, the, the restaurant's, like, the third scene, it's super early. And you already have, without really any explanation, a sense of time disparity. Yeah. It's, it's time... Uh... It flows very weirdly in this movie, and I, I, it's, it's just always hard to get kind of a finger on it. Like if they didn't tell you, if they didn't tell you that they were going to the beginning at, of the of the movie when they were when they went to the beginning of the movie, when they go to the concert with like uh, 
what was it? The Gallagher Holocaust song. <laughs> Camel Holocaust. My Melon Soul. <laughs> Crushed by Gallagher. Some great lyrics in there. Um, like, when it goes into that, we get something where it's just like, okay, this is very much, she's mentioning it was like right after they graduated high school. We're getting into that feel of the characters. Maybe we're going to see how this all begins. And then we are introduced to one of my favorite bit players, um, not just in this movie, but it, probably in any early 2000s movie with Robert Marley. Oh, man. The, the, the very formal Bob Marley, Robert Marley. Yes, but given the, like, what what do you think with this whole, okay, so, like, back to Koi Notes, if we, if we have Koi Notes on, on, on him. Uh, okay, so, with Robert Marley, I wrote, I don't know if they're on dueling drugs, the same drug, or if we're on the drug that we're supposed to be experiencing their drugs, and do they know each other, or do they know each other through drugs? Uh, I, I, that might make sense if you haven't seen the movie, but probably not, but does that make sense to you? <laughs> So this is the guy who is tripping balls at the party and tries these things. Like, we've seen people try to say, I can tell you the dream that you had last night when bombs will land on U.S. soil and make all these preposterous claims. But then he does it? And what I was wondering watching it was, since we've already messed with time, has he already met this guy? Are they having that mushroom hive mind thing? Is this something that'll be explained later, which it kind of is, but kind of not. Like we see it kind of happen with him, with Paul's character later, but like it's never actually fully fleshed out. And like at this point, I'm like, am I experiencing a trip? Like am I, <laughs> as the viewer, supposed to be like incredulous? Yeah, it's, oh, uh, and like it, some great dialogue though. Um, some great acting from this actor uh, who I had not seen in anything else. No, uh, it, it felt like someone they like went to like art school with, and that was the one. Yeah, like like it felt like here's this great thespian we know, one off. Like yeah, he, he goes from that laughing dude at the party screwing around to telling the story about about David's ex girlfriend, and you want to know the name of your soulmate? That his eyes change so much in that scene. It's just like one of those those things where he has two minutes of screen time in this movie. It might be one of the most impactful parts for it. For yeah, me. it's it's one of the more memorable like visuals. Like I remember that whole sequence and the levitation joke and all that stuff going on. And we meet one of my favorite supporting characters, the dog. Really soon. The dog. The dog Barkley, um, played by himself. Yes, that was not a name from the book. That was the rescue dog's name, which is yes. fantastic. Absolutely. So, um, so where do we go from here? Um, so, uh, John, uh, after that, that scene at the party, uh, John meets up with the, that dude, unbeknownst to us, um, gives another call to Dave in the middle of the night uh, and is just twacked out of his mind in a way that David, in the beginning of the movie, gets a, a similar phone call, but it's like, oh, this is real. I need to get my friend to the hospital. He's on drugs. Um, goes, attempts that. Gets a little weird. Um, we're introduced to the um, element of the soy sauce. Um, and there is just... It, it keeps on messing with your mind. There's there's spiders out of the corner of your eye. There's the, the evil demon monsters that are really, really well done uh, for the limited yeah, the, budget the this movie has. CGI budgets. Really impressed with those. I also wrote down the word symbiote like at least four times. Uh, like there's a there's a definite like living black goo symbiote energy plus the spider mm -hmm. imagery. It's very like I was definitely in my fandom for a few moments because the thing moves so cool and kinetically. Like I love how the yeah. soy sauce looks. Yeah, on well, the the line. Let me explain this without cursing. The crazy uh, the crazy shit from Planet X looked like it was growing hair and it was moving. It was like fucking great great monologuing on the parts of this i wish i'd actually written down the proper quotes um but uh we, we go from there we're introduced to roger north um to D uh doug jones character in this being just doug jones <laughs> it's it's really impressive work i i really enjoy him without like restraints and i really like that the film just let it go there and that's what this movie does like it often just lets go of the steering wheel and like you just kind of you just kind of see what happens and that's what i mean by like the yes and because it, it feels like 
they got to write in reaction to the last chapter and then they loyally adapted it. And this character feels like they figured him out like a week ago. And I love mm-hmm. it because it feels so spontaneous and chaotic. Oh yeah. It's on, uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's amazing line after amazing line in the book it, it, in, in the film too, with, you know, um, the, the whole thing with, uh, I want, I once I once witnessed a man masturbate until he bled. Well, did he enjoy that? And when you're <laughs> alone, the line he has is like you have to think about your experience of that line. Like, what is his perception of the world, and what is yours in conjunction with it? <laughs> it's just the uh, the the quick action. There's there's some quick action, like quick, quick, almost like Edgar Wright cuts. Yeah. Like when he grabs the the axe in the beginning, or in the scene with the the cigarette lighter, where he burns the worm, grabs Doug Jones and puts the the gun to his neck and says, "And I quote, Are you familiar with the phrase? I want to shoot you so hard, my uh, shoot you so bad, my dick is hard." And then there's immediately a callback to it. Like yeah. that was one I almost saw him on the page. Like you can see where there'd be like a paragraph stanza immediate callback page flip like it's it's such an immediate callback joke which i dig so we go from there to to his arrest uh and we find out that everybody's died that that john has just died and then this is the point when you're watching this movie at home for the first time you're like it said john dies at the end uh, <laughs> oh wait hold on i've got an important note about this uh <laughs> okay I go, all right, is this the end? Because I thought the beginning was the end. And then I thought the scene with the guy on drugs was the end. Are we at the end? Does this whole thing take place at the end? Wait, wait, this phone calling trope is my new favorite thing. So immediately we get this amazing recurring joke with a phone call. And the phone call is my favorite bit of the film. Because you don't know when it's coming and it always serves the narrative and it's always fun. Oh yeah. And at one point it's a hot dog. (laughs) Uh, well, one, one, like once he's once he switches from the phone to the hot dog, and he's just like, "That this bratwurst cost three bucks? Shit!" Well, check the bun. There's a hundred dollar bill inside. Ah, uh, do you have your ATM card? Just <laughs> <laughs> great use of like the the actor who played John and the actor who played Dave just did some great ADR with this. <laughs> they had you buy some, that whole sequence way more than you should. Yeah. And the the idea of oh you're gonna be getting phone calls from me for the next eight or nine years and like it's actually it's one of those things that you can tell that the guy who wrote this was a huge fan of comic books because there's a lot of comic book noir horror and comedy all mixed into all of this. Oh um, yeah, and the delivery from both the leads like they might be in different movies but they both understand comedic delivery in the comic book realm. Yeah. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, so we get to the to the trailer park from there. Uh, another late great line d- delivery with uh, you might be wondering why I'm hand- holding this can of gasoline. <laughs> the just spot on, spot on, cartoonish. After going through this entire thing of being transcendent, going through multiple universes and doing trillions of calculations in a second, we're back to reality, and this this reality is somewhat of a of a cartoon. It's now what's interesting about that is I wonder, and that neither of us have read the book, but I wonder how that feels in the book because they literally spell it out for us and then show us. So I wonder mm-hmm. like how that felt because it, it, you know a book is imagination. But you're going from a narrative structure to a different format of narrative structure. Like, I wonder how that translated because people say how, like, loyal of an adaptation this is. Because it felt like an insane pivot, which I dug. But, like, mm-hmm. would that work in a book chapter change? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's – I I could see it as uh, as actually the, the end of a chapter with him going into that. And then when he awakens being the beginning of the, of the, of the next kind of segment of the movie. Yeah. Um, so we go from there to uh let's see here what do we have next for notes on your end uh after the cartoon i've got um the police scene with the ghost uh the ghost cop oh 
So the uh, the, the unreality phone call because we're in the phone call sequence where he actually bites it in another reality to my to my recollection of the realities of this. Okay, so talking to the ghost cop. So oh no, wait, hold on. Wiener Schnitzel was after that. Yeah. So we're where we're at right now. <laughs> this is my at. point of me being confused throughout what time was. So when uh so when he wakes up, there's a whole sequence with the burning down the burning down the building. Uh and then like we go, we remember the flashback of uh David seeing John in the in, in the munitions factory and misloading a shell and getting shot with a with a dummy round and surviving. Wakes up, building's burning. Um, and then um, Barkley uh, Barkley drives into the the house and saves uh, saves Dave. And they go and fight John from there. They fight John from there. They go and find John from there. Find okay. Yeah, that it's when it's sense. when it's when John is in uh, Barkley's head. It's when the dog talks telepathically. Yes. And then we then at the end that ties into the Schumer Giraffe dog moment, and that gives us hints that that dog sequence is coming. Right. So just real quick, this movie, The Congress and uh the South and Tales. You've seen all three of these movies now. These yes. are movies that when I tell people about them, I can tell them I tell them random pieces, bits and pieces of this movie, and then they're like, Oh, that sounds weird. I'll check it out. Did you check this out? By the way, this happens in the movie. And by the time they actually see it, they don't they don't believe that's a real movie that you're telling them about. Yeah, like, they, I, I've gotten lost three times in this conversation that I've seen, and we're actually going narratively in order. But since the movie's so disjointed in a positive, I don't remember when John dies, not at the end, and it's a lot. Like, there's no way to keep up with the pacing of this movie because sometimes it's slow-paced with the monologues, and the insanity. Sometimes there's a Schumer giraffe. There's always an adorable dog after the first act. And all of it's crazy. Like it's yeah. it's it's like a movie that has a third act opening, and then the second and third act are just competing to be the new third act. Yeah. It's well, and like the, the original intro of the book exists separately from books from like book one and book two. Um looking at least from what I read of the structure, and it's just so we we get through basically the end of that narrative thread, and we uh, we go and find John's John alive with uh, with Amy with Fred um, another uh, in oh I guess we we I skipped shitload I skipped shitload yeah because right now you're to the hand almost right and that's way later yeah we're I skipped shitload so that's oh that's like right after this is uh, like when they go. Uh, Dave and the uh, Dave and the John dog go and meet up with uh, with Justin, the uh, the gangster kid who's at his apartment, uh, and he's been possessed by the demons. Yes, and yep. there's a great monologue in like Wangsta. Like there's an incredible Wangsta monologue that's really top of work. Um, demons need to speak Wangsta more. Yeah, I literally wrote the all I wrote down for that scene was the word Wangster dialogue, top notch. <laughs> Because like the dude is very impressive in his blonde curly hair wanksterdom, and it's it's quality work. It's it's so good. It's so so good. So he gets kidnapped into the back of the van where we meet up with Amy, with Fred, with John, whose uh, consciousness had been removed, and gets sat back into him by the dog. That's where. And now we're at. this is where I fall madly in love with this dog. Because this dog, like, is just a, a, I find out after the fact, is a rescue. But has such sentience and such intelligence in its eyes that I'm like, oh, I believe the twist with the dog later. Because the whole time I'm like, there's more to this dog. At one point, my theory was that the, the dog was the source of the drugs. I thought the dog <laughs> might have, like, been the thing that created this element. Like, you remember in Spider-Man, uh, the animated series, when, like, the symbiote comes from them, like, uh, the, the moon, and it attaches... I was like, yo, this dog's going to be the way that this stuff got to the planet. Like, I was trying to figure out, like, I have this whole dog conspiracy <laughs> theory. Yeah, it's weird that you never get the answers. Like, I mean, you kind of get an answer oh, for the source of Oh, first act answers. Like, oh, it's, yeah. it's a series of third acts. <laughs> so, we get to, uh, okay, so, so, Dave tries to, 
Dave tries to kill uh, shitload. Uh, there's the fun scene with. Uh, so are we coming? Wait, are we going to the mall or are we coming from the mall? Which is how this review is felt. Which is how this movie feels. Are we going to the mall or are we coming from the mall? And it gives you a nice little place marker with. Oh, we must be going to the mall, Freddie. You haven't died yet. <laughs> what? Yeah, the fact that there's that line of dialogue in the movie shows how we're actually doing a pretty good job keeping up of con- like the, the chronology because it is madness, dude. Yes. They're making the movie and throwing that in there for us. Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's just, it's such a good line, too. Um, okay, so, I we're in the mall. I want to give Danny, Danny M in the chat saying, for someone who has not watched this movie, this all sounds insane. Even when you've watched this movie, this all is insane. Nothing will change except for you will have lived this with us. Matt saying this is the closest to an acid trip you'll ever want to get. <laughs> Not watching the movie. Not watching the movie. Watching us explain this to you is probably the closest <laughs> you want to get. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So. <laughs> they get to the mall. Um, there's the ghost door that needs to be um, handled by a phantom limb, which is why Amy's there. Love um, that scene. Yes, uh, but they uh, they try to escape, um, and then the, the whole scene with Apton happens, where uh, J- uh, Apton kills uh, shitload, shitload incepts Appleton and infects him, and then we go to Appleton gets into Fred, just everybody dies, <laughs> everybody dies efficiently. Yes. Very quickly uh, and very confusingly. Because <laughs> I didn't catch that first leap the first time. Like, you just said it. I'm like, that's what happened. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, so they uh, they get past, uh, past the door into the, to the alternate reality, and they're met by somebody that we have not mentioned yet in this review. And that is Clancy Brown's Marconi. Clancy Brown, scene stealing Clancy Brown as a crazy, crazy, like, suit. John thing. Edwards. Like, <laughs> John yeah, Edwards. He's a total, like, like, big oil salesman. Like, he's incredible. But it, it's like, once again, it's all real. How the hell is it all real? Um, so, um, so they get, they put on their men- mission to destroy Cora, Korok. By the way, it's one of those things when you hear Roger North bring up Korok earlier in the movie on a rewatch, it, it really kind of helps put things back into into order for you. Um, but um, get the whole story about how it's a, a, a sentient computer that's become a genocidal god that's trying to invade their reality. So, you know, the, the, the acid trip's going really well. Single uh, chunk of exposition, by the way. That moment yes. is a single chunk of exposition. It's not a whole scene. It's not an explain-o. It's literally a line. And you're like, okay, here we are. Yeah, this is yep. what happened. <laughs> it's an LSD-laced C4 explosive that they're given to kill Korok with. So they go through the portal to the alternate Earth. Uh, the disciples show up. The disciples. Do you have notes on the disciples? <laughs> Uh, I have this sequence is the most terrifying Cartoon Network cutscene I never saw as a kid, and I'm safer for it. There's an entire sequence that you remember those little four minute vignettes in between shows. There's a sequence here that is that, but on your worst acid trip. There's literally yeah. like I I was I wrote Cartoon Network fears in here because I remember being a kid and like catching you know, little segments of, of uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force that I was a little too young for, or like a, a little sequence that my brain would go nuts with. This is the end result of that. Like this is actually as terrifying as I thought it was as a kid, but in a sequence, it's a lot. Oh, uh, there's um, Alan Resnick, who, does, who did a lot of those things, like unedited footage of the bear, the bear, ties into a lot of the backstory of this book too. Um, so... Yeah, a lot of those those car- Cartoon N- Network trippy things were actually directed by Alan Resnick. Um, so- uh, my, my next note, once we come out of that, is I wonder if this is a cutscene from Ma- Ma- Multiverse of Madness, because the Shuma Karath is fully attacking our league. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's just fully a Shuma Karath sequence. 
Just the straight up spider apocalypse. <sighs> it's so good. I think this movie makes less sense now that I've talked about it out loud. I thought we would come to a place where it made more sense. But the more I talk about it, the less real it sounds. I thought I had a handle on this before I started talking to you. <laughs> I did research. I've seen this movie six times. <laughs> I've read pages of, of, of uh, transcriptions of dialogue. I've read uh, three different explaino like chunks of dialogue. I've read the wiki, I've read the IMDb, and I watched a video about how it got made, and I still can't tell you what this movie is. We we are oh, we're over double time, and we are like almost to the end of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you were like, it'll be like 20 minutes, and I was like, no, that's yeah. like that's like just telling about like the normal parts, and that's not like this. This is insane. Yeah. So uh, they. Uh... So the dog saves the day. The dog saves the day. The dog has been actually possessed by Clancy Brown, so he's been sidekick visioning from Clancy Brown, mind controlling him, and our two leads were actually just stooges this whole time and so lassie 2 kamikazes into the shumagarath with an lsd bomb lassie 2 kamikazes into the shumagarath with an lsd bomb you're welcome never thought you'd say that did you <laughs> but here we are so so we get to the uh get back to the present John's <laughs> alive. It can't be the present. None of it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, did John actually ever die? I don't. I don't know. At the end is the end. Of the beginning. It's back to my weird note where I write end four times. What is the end? <laughs> so, uh, so Arnie's like, go picture on publishing the story. He thinks he got something there. We're gonna, we're gonna take all the risks because of. Uh, you know, I, I've been through this before. I'm I'm here for journalism. I had this cop stand over my body and say uh, a gamer word at him. Um, and it's like, why did you say, why are you calling you that word? And the realization that Arnie is black uh, means, well, Arnie was dead before we got there and he just told this entire story for no reason. <laughs> Our entire narrative journey was for nothing. It's just purposeless. It is just so good. And I mean, it's just peak Giamatti. Peak Giamatti as he... Oh, he's excellent in this. He's so good in this. Like, yeah, just like literally pops out of existence crying and also, oh acting God. with the imaginary spider cage creature, excellent work. Fantastic. Uh, Giamatti, like, I didn't realize how much of a big sci-fi fan he was and like, and why he likes doing crazy small projects like this because of the love of uh, the narrative? It seems uh, like he shepherded this thing to exist. He was saying, like, it's a, it's an abundance of too many darlings, and, like, he was, he was raving about this book. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just... Just Jeff's kiss to Paul Giamatti there. Um, but uh, yeah, so film wraps up uh, and it's after, after these events, uh, John and Dave are playing basketball and throw their ball into another dimension because shit happens. They go in after it. There's a paramilitary organization that like, they're the saviors again. And it's like, oh, you're, you're, you're going to do this to us again. Yeah, whatever. Um, and they are completely nonchalant about their extreme, crazy, fucked up paranormal existence, which is just beautiful. My, my last note, and it ties immediately into my research, is my last note is, are those the Galaxy Quest suits? And then I wrote underneath it after looking it up, those are the Galaxy Quest suits. Those are the Galaxy Quest suits? <laughs> they were left over from filming Galaxy Quest. Those are the alien race suits. <laughs> that is fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, so you gotta... it's very fitting. My last note is: Are those? They are. <laughs> they are. Wow. Um. Just thought we did get I, a. I'm glad I got to give you new knowledge. Yes. Yeah. I would never have. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs>
Okay, now, after that whole journey, I have a movie recommendation for you that actually ties into the feel of this movie, which is saying a lot. It's a little bit more linear in that it would probably be able to be explained in like 35 minutes instead of 45, but even then it's a lot. And I would say it's the movie that feels the closest to a drug trip that I've ever had. Pro and okay. It is called The Wave. Have you heard of it or seen it? The Wave. I have not seen it sounding relatively familiar. It is Justin Long and Donald Faison, so that alone should sell you. Okay. And it was written by a buddy of mine that I go to Burning Man with, which should also sell you, because that's how I heard about it. And then I came back and I was like, oh, he did it. He captured the feeling. And it is absolutely a trip. And I thought of it like 10 times watching this movie. Okay, I have this noted right now, and I have the IMDb pulled up. Twenty. Okay, that sounds amazing. Um, real quick, we do have a uh, five dollars stream labs from Danny uh, saying AJ saying this, and the best of positive vibes. Thank you, Danny. Uh, this movie sounds insane, and I may never watch it, but watching <laughs> y'all has been fun. That, Question for fair. Koi: Is there a comic that made you feel like this movie? A comic book. That's a great question. Um, it definitely had some Kirby in its grandiose, absurd, wonky cosmicness. Um, like when I read Kirby as a kid and didn't grasp it as much, I often felt like that in this movie where I was like, what is going on? But I'm happy. Um, yeah, I'm going to say 60s Kirby with a little bit of um, the imagery and cover. I don't know if you've heard of cover, but it's Brian Michael Bendis and it's illustrated by David Mack. And there's a lot of really, like, experimental, like, mind-warpy visuals to take you between transitions. And this movie doesn't have a lot of crazy transitions. The movie just happens at you. But it kind of gives you that, like, experimental flavor. Both of those are still more linear than this, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, one quick thing um, before we wrap up. Uh, William Hill in the chat saying, okay, I've decided <laughs> I haven't seen this movie. I mean, Yeah. Yeah, are I'm you sure? I mean, it, it, it's a maybe earlier. The first 20 minutes, you might have seen it. <laughs> okay, so uh, final thoughts? Uh, I enjoyed it more in talking about it. So it's now a more solid C+. I think I said C, C+. It's a solid C+, mm -hmm. for me. Um, above average, while still having moments of like, I don't know if they meant to confuse me or if I'm just confused or if it's a filmmaking choice. Uh, but overall, worth the experience but definitely not a casual view. Um, I think The Wave... So The Wave is an A- minus for me. Uh, okay. it's, it's actually one of my favorite drug films ever. Uh, it actually took over Requiem for a Dream when I rewatched it recently. Um, oh, because Requiem for a Dream captures all the darkness of drugs without any of the real, like, positivity. Whereas The Wave keeps you that level of darkness, but instead of, like, brutal torture porn imagery, it makes you emotionally feel that dark. But it also manages to make you feel that high, which is impressive. So... The, the Wave, to me, is a good companion film to this. So in having that comparison, I have to say, like, this did a lot of those things, but I don't know how intentional they were, whereas The Wave feels intentional for those goals. Um, <laughs> so I really am glad to have seen both because now I know what it feels like to feel like it was on a path or if I'm just on a roller coaster. Uh, but, like, I'm glad to have seen this insanity. You always give me, like, a very challenging journey. Um, I think this and, and The Council are the two most challenging uh, and even that has way more linear a path than this, which is saying yes. something. That movie is that shit. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's always a fun, uh, fun, fun task if I can find a challenging film for you. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, the project where we do this, um, I'm a patron of Koi Jandros. You can find him on Patreon. Uh, the Tots membership. Uh, there's uh, there's three total, I believe, two occupied right now. Where it's a hundred dollar level, and he will review a piece of content of your choice within certain bounds. We have not found those extremities yet, but God help me, I'm trying. <laughs> We've uh, been like approaching, but I'm like, I trust AJ's weirdness. Let's see what happens. <laughs> let's let's go. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, definitely check out his Patreon. Uh, Cole, you're gonna be at the El Capitan and said tomorrow. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, no, sorry, it's Thursday. I kept saying Thursday. tomorrow because I thought today was Wednesday. Uh, luckily, I figured it out before the stream. 
Um, on Thursday, when Eternals debuts, it plays at like eight or nine o'clock everywhere. If you go to the LCAP at seven, they're playing it early for like a fan event. So it's the premier showing of LCAP in the nation, and I'm emceeing it. So I'm, I'm hosting the first official screening of Eternals, which is an impossible honor. Uh, I really love the movie. I'm, I'm ready to fight the next month uh, all the bullshit that's coming to me. But uh, I, I'm ready to defend its honor. It's a hill I'm willing to die on. So it, yeah. it feels good that Marvel noticed enough. They're like, the man's ready to die on this hill. Let's let's let him introduce it. Dude, I will be seeing it this weekend for sure. I got uh, mentioning, talk, man. It's our shield. Yeah. Like, uh, like mentioning, uh, we talked a little bit about you know blockbusters and how they're changing, how Dune was different, um, how the Eternals is supposed to be different, how... Uh, there's some different blockbusters that are coming uh, coming down the pike, so it's something that has really uh, really been exciting for me. Um, but yeah, uh, you guys can find uh, you can find me always on What the Show. Tomorrow night is going to be our lost stream uh, from the year 2000, uh, back from back when I had a soul patch. So you can catch that. Oh, yes, you can catch that live at 8 p.m. PT as well. Um, I did too. I had, I had yeah. a phase. Yeah, that we're gonna. And we're not going to be talking about like the Dune movie. We're going to be talking about the sci-fi, sci-fi miniseries, what to expect in the Matrix sequels. It's going to be a ro- rolling good time. But uh, yeah, for you guys, uh, for uh, for Kojandro and for what the show, this has been John dies at the end. Good God, a we love you. Uh, a review? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> love you.